Welcome back to this new issue of our PBL Talks, which essentially is a, a series of short video clips whereby we discuss with eminent professors and uh, professionals from several foreign countries about international tax law matters with a focus on the actual outbreak in court. Today, we are glad to introduce you Professor David Rosenblum from the New York University. Uh, Professor Rosenblum is uh, also the director of the International Tax Program and is also a lawyer, a tax lawyer at Kaplan and Drysdale Law Firm. Uh, so, um, Professor Rosenblum, what do you think about the tax measures that the US government has adopted uh, and or um, are going to be adopted within the United States? Well, we've done some very, very uh, major legislation as a result of the coronavirus uh, situation. And in that legislation, there are some significant tax provisions, uh, which on a standalone basis would be major tax legislation. If they weren't, they're, they're part of a much bigger piece of legislation. The legislation, the cost of the legislation is $2 trillion. I, the, I don't know what the tax legislation costs on its own, but I've heard numbers as high as, um, as $500 billion. I, it may not be quite that much for reasons that I will explain, uh, but it's, um, it's big, it's big. And uh, some of the change, all the changes on their face are domestic. There, there's no significant, there's no changes at all directly to the international provisions of our law. Our law is the Internal Revenue Code. But uh, there, are, there are three major changes of which two of them are, have an impact on cross-border uh, investment. So in the, the first one is a change in our rule for net operating losses. The second one is our change in the rule for the interest deduction. And the third is a change in our rule for the use of trade or business uh, deductions by non-corporations against other income. So that third one, which is not insignificant, has I can't see any real cross-border implications to that of any substance. That basically applies to people like um, build, uh, real property developers who ha generate losses and use those losses against their investment income, to reduce their investment income. That practice was curtailed uh, in 2017 when we passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was a major, itself a major statute, very major statute. Uh, and what they've essentially done is they've taken off the limitation that came in with the TCJA, and they've allowed people to use losses against uh, um, against other income. Now that's all, that only applies to non corporates, so it's not a multinational provision, and it's not a, really a cross border provision. The idea, though, which is true for all three of these provisions, is to put money into the hands of people quickly. So the other two do have international uh, uh, implications. The, the loss carryover rule is probably the most significant. Um, at, prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, our rule on net operating losses was that you could carry them back two years and forward 20 years. So there was a 23-year period in which to use net operating losses. And they could be used to reduce income in a year to which they're carried down to zero. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act restricted the use of net operating losses. They could not be carried back at all. They could be carried forward indefinitely, but they could only offset 80% of taxable income. That was the coming out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. That's that was the, the change, a major change. What they've done now in the CARES Act is they've, they've uh, eliminated for three years, the years 18, 19, and 20, the, the limitation of losses to 80%, so now losses can be used fully. And more importantly, they have allowed losses in those years to be carried back five years, 
which is pretty extraordinary. Now, we did that back in the financial crisis, so there was some precedent for doing that. But the problem or the, the issue here is that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act reduced our corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. So these losses are being generated in years of 21%, and they can be carried back across that divide to years in which the tax rate was 35%. So there's a, if you can generate losses, you can carry them back five years. You can go all the way back uh, to 2013, if you had a loss in 2018, and, and, and recover taxes at paid at a 35% rate. So that's the thought. That's the, that, the, those are the two big changes. They, they basically undid the limitations that they put in in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, just like with the excess business losses. Same, same concept. Remove the limitations that the TCJA had created. The problem that I see, and I think others see, is that it's hard to see who gets money from this and how they get it quickly because the returns for 2019 haven't yet been filed by and large. A 2019 calendar year taxpayer, not all ta taxpayers are calendar year, so some have filed. But a calendar year taxpayer uh, doesn't file until 75 days into, into the 2020. Um, and most taxpayers ask for extensions up to uh, eight, months later, right? you have to file by October 15th. So on a normal schedule, the big corporations, most of them, not all, but most of them wouldn't be filing until September, October. So you don't have returns, therefore you don't have losses, therefore how can you carry anything back? And for 2020, which is the year when the losses are expected to really hit, of course, that year hasn't even run, let alone returns filed. So it's a little hard to see how this is going to get money into people's hands very quickly for from 2019 and 2020. From 2018, those returns have been filed. People can file immediately for uh, carrybacks up to five years. But 2018 was not an epidemic year. For that matter, neither was 2019. So who had losses in 2018 and 2019? It's going to be random. It's not, not all core, you, you don't have major industries losing money. And 2018 was a good economic year. Uh, 2019 basically was a pretty good economic year. So yes, there will be companies with losses who can take advantage, but it's not gonna be all of companies and it's certainly not gonna be entire industries like airlines and cruise ships and things like that. The other thing that's very interesting here is that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act brought in some lower tax rates for certain kinds of income. Global intangible low taxed income, which is income controlled foreign corporations, foreign derived intangible income, which is basically export income. Those are taxed respectively at 10.5% and 13.125% after the TCJA. Taxpayers are gonna be very um, wary of using losses against low taxed income. They'll be wasting those losses. If you generate losses in a 21% year and carry them back, you, you want to apply them in a 35% year, but you sure as heck don't want to apply them against income that was only taxed at 10.5% or income that was fully shielded from US tax by the foreign tax credit. So the international implications of this are, are quite substantial quite substantial. Now, the other big change, the third big change, is the interest deduction. And prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we had a very elaborate earnings stripping rule uh, in which you could deduct basically up to 50% of your taxable business income. Um, but if you paid more than that to related persons, related mostly foreign persons, it was limited. It was something of a joke. The law was very complicated. I don't think it really stopped many interest deductions. But now what's happened is they removed, the, in, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they removed the, the, the generosity of the prior law, 
and they reduced the limit to 30%. Interest was deductible up to 30% of taxable income, and it didn't matter who it was paid to. So a U.S. person, corporation, individual, anybody, paying 30% to anybody, to Citibank, to, to, to a lender, an unrelated lender, can't deduct more than 30%. It was a very tough rule, which would have hit a lot of foreign companies investing in the United States. There are various exceptions. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying the, the law. Everything in the U.S. is very complicated. But what the CARES Act did was to basically uh, go back to a 50% limitation. Now, they, they didn't relate it only to related foreign persons, but they raised the limitation from 30% to 50%. And for the year 2020, they said that uh, taxpayers could use their business income from 2019, which makes sense because everyone is anticipating that in 2020, people are going to have losses. So if they have business losses, they're not going to get any interest deductions. So they can use their 2019 numbers to give rise to uh, greater interest deductions in 2020. And there's a relationship between the interest, the, the change in the interest deduction and the net operating loss carryback because it's anticipated that people will have to borrow in 2020 because all these businesses are in, in trouble. So they're going to use their interest deductions and the higher limit to create more net operating losses, which can then be carried back five years to 35% years. So I think, I think the story was very complicated even before this. But now, on top of all the complication that we had coming out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we now have additional level of, comp of very complicated computations. And I think the computations are going to have to be done company by company. It's going to depend on each company's situation. Um, the modeling exercise here is going to be for every, all the accounting firms are going to get you know, spend a lot of time doing modeling. I think law firms are going to have to learn how to model because companies don't know what to do. They've got difficult choices to make. And so those are the big changes in the CARES Act. Now, there's one other thing to mention, and then I'll turn it over for other questions, which is apart from the CARES Act, which is, uh, we, and by the way, I, I should add, we're on the verge of doing another major statute as early possibly as today. And I don't know what's in there. You, you never, from a tax standpoint, unless you're following this very closely, you never know what tax provisions will be in there. But I will be surprised if there are no tax provisions in that. That hasn't passed yet. It hasn't passed either House of Congress. But they're talking as though they're going to put more money out for, uh, for small businesses and to some extent for, um, uh, also for testing. That's the big issue in the United States is testing. So there'll be tax provisions in that too. Uh, the other thing to mention is this. <clears throat> um, the, we have, like most countries, a variety of tests in our law, in our tax law, that depend on presence in, in a jurisdiction. For example, one of our tests for who's a resident of the United States depends on number of days in the United States. So the question has arisen, what happens with people who can't leave? I mean, many of my students at NYU would like to go home and can't. Uh, people are trapped, and they're going to violate those tests. And the statutory tests on their face are not flexible enough to give our tax authority uh, the right to relieve those tests. So, so, for example, if you're in the United States, this is a very important rule for us, foreign person, non-U.S. citizen who's in the U.S. for a total of 183 days, computed as 100% of this year, one-third of last year, and one-sixth of the year before. So the magic number is 122. If you do the math, it comes to 183. They're a, re they're a statutory resident of the United States. Now, there are rules which don't count days of students. They don't count days of certain certain people, professional athletes who are here. There's, there's exceptions, but they're not geared to anything like this pandemic. 
So you got people who were trapped in the United States and who are going to become statutory residents of the United States. And it's not clear what's going to happen. My own sense is that our tax authorities are going to find some way to say that they simply won't apply those rules. But we haven't heard anything about that yet. And the Internal Revenue Service, which is a vast agency in the United States, it, it, it employs many, many, many people throughout the country. They're all working from home. So it's very hard to get their attention. It's very hard to get things done. So, um, so there's a lot of issues that are up in the air as a result of the COVID-19. And, and I think, you know, on a daily basis, I, I sort of hear things happening. I try to follow. And of course, there's also at the state level, the states have their own tax systems and they have to deal with the same kinds of things, involuntary presence in the United States. Most of the states will not follow, a lot of them follow federal taxation, but they're not likely to follow the CARES Act because they can't afford it. It is, the states are hurting for money. So we have, we have a lot of tax issues uh, in the United States. I'm sure you do in Italy as well, but that, that's our situation. Thank you very much. A really clear, uh, clear view of the, of the US, uh, US context, fantastic. I do agree with you. Also in Italy, we have lots of complexity and uh, lots of uh, changement in the, in the rules. Uh, allow me to, to step a little bit uh, up from the domestic legislation to the international context. So we will be very glad to have also your, your opinion on the, on the impact on the international uh, tax context uh, of, of this crisis. We, we need to take care, obviously, not only from a domestic standpoint, but also from an international point of view. Right. Well, I, I actually think that, uh, that it will have a direct impact on the digital debate that's going on at the OECD. Uh, and I think, I think um, my own sense, I mean, there's, there's going to be a greater sense of urgency to do something, but it's not going to be any easier to reach a resolution. And I think what's going to happen as a result of this is that a lot of countries are going to decide uh, to act on their own. Some already have. Italy is one. Italy's got a web tax. France has postponed its tax. The UK says they're going forward. I think Australia is going forward. I, I don't. I think countries are going to be less willing to defer imposing uh, these digital taxes in one form or another, and that's because the countries all are going to need the money. All their tax systems are going to be severely hit, and you've got these big um, uh, internet. Uh, IT companies of various kinds operating and earning a lot of money with still with it. In fact, to some extent, the technology companies are going to earn even more because look at us. We're here on this con conversing on Zoom. People are, there's going to be, there's going to be a real need, more, even more of a need for this kind of mode of communication. My sense is that what's going to happen is that countries are going to go on their own. And I think that to some extent, that's also going to be uh, spurred on by the by the epidemic, by the by the pandemic, uh, countries are, are are turning very much nationalist as a general matter. They're concerned about their own populations. They look what's happening at their neighbors. I think that's going to play out in tax systems. So you have that. Uh, you may also get more. Um, disputes, uh, you know, uh, transfer pricing disputes. I think that's going to take more time because I think we're obviously not living in, in normal circumstances. And I, I, don't, I don't get the sense, at least in the United States, that the Internal Revenue Service is being very active. In, in fact, they've suspended new cases, for, with the exception of, with some very specific exceptions, our Internal Revenue Service has, has uh, suspended uh, bringing new tax cases for the, the duration of this pandemic. So, and I suspect that's happening. It may not be announced, but I suspect that's going to happen in other countries as well. Thank you very much, David, for your for your clear thought and for the outlook that you provide us. I hope to have the chance to to see back you again, and uh, of course, uh, this crisis will be. Uh, an important match. So hope uh, that everything uh, will, will go well. Yeah. Thank you again. Bye bye. Thank David. you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank Excellent. you so much, David. Bye. Okay, bye, -bye. bye, -bye.